So um, I don't know how much people know about this. You probably have an idea, the basic idea. Uh, what is it? Does anybody have any idea what, the, what, what is the LIBOR index? Yeah. Yeah. So, would you give me a five-minute warning? You know, just when the time is up. Okay. Uh, it's a synthetic index. What I mean by synthetic, it's not a real index. It, it, it doesn't reflect actual rates. In other words. Something called the prime rate, which everybody's probably heard of, which in, in, in a long time ago and still exists, uh, was a rate that was used to be the the rate that banks would charge their best customers, and then that, that was modified. And sometime in the 1980s, rather than using the um, the prime rate as a means of pricing interest rate securities or interest rate objects, uh, they, uh, they, they switched over to this thing called the LIBOR. It happened in the 1980s. The, the, the reason why it occurred I, is not clear to me. I, mean, did they, I don't know the answer to that. Did they do that because they wanted something that they could easily manipulate? Perhaps. I don't know. Uh, you can say that the prime rate, in a sense, is more stable than the LIBOR rate because it's generally, right now it's generally three percentage points above something called the Fed funds rate. So right now, the Fed funds rate is determined by the Federal Reserve. So presumably if there was a national bank, uh, you could, the national bank could set that rate and then say the prime rate is gonna be X percentage points above the Fed funds rate. There would be, that would be totally deterministic. You would know um, what that rate was gonna be. There wouldn't be any question. The LIBOR is a foggy concept because you have 18, for example, for the US dollar, uh, and there are several currencies. There's a LIBOR, there's a TIBOR, and there's a EUROBOR. One for European, one for Tokyo. And note that there isn't a CHIBOR for China. <laughs> Hopefully there never will be. Um, so you have 18 banks report every day around 11 a.m., what would it cost you to borrow money from another bank? And they, they submit that. And they take the 18 submissions and they lock off the four lowest and the four highest. That's a total of eight, so they have a remaining of uh, uh, 10. So they take a what is called the trimmed average. <coughs> so they knock it down to 10. Fine. Stability. Problem is, didn't work. <laughs> Who's in charge of it? The BWA. Does anybody know what the BWA stands for? British. <laughs> British WA. <laughs> BWA. Is that the British? <laughs> it's the British Wankers Association. Oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm not going to get into to the uh, details. So you're not going to tell us what BWA is. It's, it's, it's a joke. I, made I know, it up. but what is BWA? BBA is the British Bankers Association. <laughs> Otherwise known as British Wankers Association. Um, how, how is it used? So you take this base rate, you add some percentage points, and then you price mortgages, student loans, car loans. Derivatives. So, you use it for mortgages, car loans. I'm writing this up here for a, for a reason. Student loans. How about credit cards? Credit cards. Derivatives. <laughs> What are derivatives? Anybody know what a derivative is? Yeah, what, what? What is what a derivative? A derivative is, is something that derives from something else. So for example, I mean classical cases of, of derivatives are futures contracts, which farmers need. You know, corn futures, soybean futures, wheat futures, because they want stability in their pricing. 
So um, these, these uh, agricultural markets originally uh, came into existence in, in Chicago, the Chicago Board of Trade. And um, that's an example of a derivative. An option is a, if you ever bought a stock option, that's an example of a derivative. So the, the concept is anything that derives from anything else. A particular rate, a type of, of derivative is something called an interest rate swap. And I'm going to tell you something that I, I, I think is pretty shocking towards the end. Now, who thinks, you know, when you compare, when you compare the total market, the total, well, you know, and I, I, I'll define what I mean by market in a while. But when you compare this market to this market, this market, this market, what do you think is the big? Yeah, the derivatives market is huge. Yeah. Uh, when we speak about futures, does that refer to the possibilities of uh, market activity for certain products? Uh, it, 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 is it like a, a, a prediction of the demand? For no, technically, it's it, you're saying when, when you enter into a futures contract with a counterparty, you're agreeing to deliver a certain amount of bushels of corn at, at a certain price, say three months, in three months. It never happens because the contract is always settled before you actually uh, deliver. But theoretically, if you if you um, purchase a futures contract, you could take delivery of bushels of corn, wheat, whatever. Um, I don't want to get into that though. So so a few, so it, it's it's an agreement to pay a certain price for a commodity at a certain time in the future which is uh, technically it's a forwards contract, a futures contract is something that trades on an exchange and is marked mark to market every day. Okay, so the, the derivatives market is huge and, and the, um, the LIBOR is used to a large extent to price derivatives in particular interest rate swaps. Well, gee whiz, I mean, what do you think people are going to try to do? I mean, use common sense. If you're trading a massive market, what do you think is going to drive the whole? They're going to take and try and uh, manipulate the derivative. Of course, I mean, sell it at always a point where they get the maximum return. If, if you work in the financial markets, you always want to manipulate the price. Always. It's just, it's just the nature of, of that thing. Of, of, you know, and the government, of course, knows this. Um, let's, let's get into it then. If, if you play around with the, with the LIBOR index, you can, and you can, you can see that it is theoretically possible for one bank to manipulate it, because you could drop your interest rate, you could drop your report, down to the first four and then push the other ones up and, 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 and uh, manipulate the average. But that's not what happened with this Barclays stuff. Um, in the case of Barclays, there were specific charges that were based on employee emails, if you can believe it. Uh, their, their primary evidence was employee emails and they fell into three categories. Um, So they changed the survey response for the purpose of trading profits. So they manipulated or changed response for trading profits. In other words, they uncovered emails that were communications between the department that was reporting and, and the trading desks. I mean, this is a huge violation. I mean, you know, anything you want to think of. It changed the response to protect Barclays' reputation. In other words, what happened was uh, they, had, they had trouble around 2008 when the crash happened, big fallout. They did not want the world to know that they would have had to pay higher rates, so they reported lower rates to make it seem like they were more solvent than they actually were. Of course, that's it. That's it. And collusion with other banks. This whole price fixing 
you know, if you, if you are manipulating LIBORs, you are uh, fixing, you are attempting to, to fix the price, artificially fix the price of derivatives. And that is a huge federal offense. Cool. That was the basis for what, what has come down so far as a $450 million fine to the Commodity Futures Trading Corporation and, I don't know, the, the British authority. Collusion, by the way, is, is the word that they use. It's, uh, it's sometimes known as conspiracy. Yeah. <laughs> but since, I guess since the entities that did it are, are respectable, in other words, they, they just screw little people. <laughs> they're, um, they don't use, they, they, can't, they can't possibly be described as having engaged in a conspiracy because that's a term that only, only lunatic fringe groups use. <laughs> So, um, okay, so let's go to the swaps now. And I'm, I'm coming close to making the main point. Do I have time? You've got about eight more minutes. I want to just describe the general idea of an interest rate swap. Interest, any, any kind of a swap is, is an exchange of cash flows contingent upon something. So the, the one that I'm, I'm referring to here is uh, fixed floating. Now, is everybody uh, aware of an adjustable rate mortgage? Or maybe people have lines of credit where the interest rate can be is variable. Um, let's, let's take an example of a $10 million loan. Now, I'm talking about a specific case. Well, this, this, these are not real numbers, but I'm referring to, say, a, uh, a school district. And I'm going to give you some numbers from the uh, school district of Philadelphia. By the way, I'm, I'm relying on this report called Too Big to Trust, <laughs> which uh, there was a link to from one of the LPAC articles, and that's where I got the reference to this. Uh, it's an excellent thing. It's a 10-page ten, ten summary if you want to learn more about this, and I think it's very significant. Uh, so anyway, the idea here is the, the school district of Philadelphia entered borrowed money and, and did it using a, using a floating rate bond. So the interest rates are floating. Why they did that, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a question. I mean, I, I'm assuming that they did it because they were sold the line that your interest rates will be lower, you can save this much money, and we got an, another gizmo that will really help you out because what can happen if you have an adjustable rate mortgage or floating line of credit? Yeah, the rates can go up. Right. Yeah. 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 If rates all of a sudden spike, you have no control over it. Unless right. you're hedged, you have no control over it. And all, all of a sudden, right. you're, 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 you're SOL. Right. So, um, so why, would why would they go for it in the first place? They perceived they were sold it a bill of goods that... What? The floating thing is usually it's yeah. Not I mean, not traditionally, flowing. traditionally, you know, I'll make a point at the end. But traditionally, people were only using fixed rate. So you have a counterparty on, on in order to manage the the, the floating risk risk mm -hmm. of, of possibly having a spike. You have a counterparty, which is going to be a bank. So the banks jump into this. So on on ten million, suppose this side is the bank and this side is school district. So um, they say, okay, we're gonna remove our interest rate risk. We, we entered into a floating rate. We're gonna move our interest rate by, getting, by locking in a fixed rate of say 4%. So they, they are now paying 4%. Now if you take annualized 4% and do it say on a three month basis, it comes to something like $100,000. So 100K it's paid at this point. And on the bank side, let's say that they started out paying, floating rates started out 7%, just for argument's sake. 
it, the number works out to say 175,000. So netted out, school district is collecting 75,000. Well, what happened after? Over time, the 7% went down to 4%. How does that work? What do you mean the bank is paying 7% okay. to, to them? So that's part of the loan? Yes. I see, it's a swap to, to get rid of the, the interest rate um, risk. And the terms of the deal are the bank pays floating. Now, now remember, the school district originally took out a floating rate loan. So what's happening is they're collecting the floating rate payments and this basic making their payments on the floating rate loan, so they're basically wiping it out. Right. And now they're just paying a, a certain fixed and rate. They're making a little profit. I mean, a little yeah. But when it goes down to four percent, you work out the numbers, it's it's about even, a hundred thousand gets paid, and then hundred thousand is still getting paid on this side. Well, when was the last time the interest rates were four percent? Um, after 2008, after the crash, interest rates, boom, interest rates then went down to effectively zero. So on this side, they're paying maybe another 2%, and then they're paying maybe 0.25%, which is an actual number quoted in this study. So on the 2%, they're paying out 50,000 on the 10 mil, and the 100,000 is still going to the counterpart. And in this amount, they're now paying the grand total of 6,000 250 and they are receiving 100,000. That's a nice deal for the counterparty. Not so good for the school district. Right? Except the school Question. district is getting that now. I mean, you just um, oh, you know, the school what? I don't follow you. The school district is getting 100. Yeah, in the beginning, when, when the floating rate is 7%, they're receiving more than they're paying. They like that. Oh, yes. That's Over here, it's, it's even. Over here, they're receiving fifty thousand and paying hundred thousand, so that's, okay. that's not as good. And here they're receiving six thousand and paying hundred thousand. So what happened? And, and now, since essentially two thousand eight, interest rates have stayed very, very low. So what's been happening? Well, I don't, I don't think it was that. But, um, so they're hedged out. At some point, at some point, the school district says, we've got to get out of these swaps. These swaps are crazy. We're paying out all this money. So the school district initially borrows this money at a floating rate, yeah. and then there's a third party who comes in and says, we can switch this yes. so you will get a fixed rate, and the bank is going to pay the floating rate. Exactly. Okay. That's what happened in this case. Okay. So now that after a while, now these, these interest rate swaps typically go out something like 10 years. Mm -hmm. And they're in a position where now we're paying out all this money. It looks bad. We're, we're getting a lot of flack. You know, we, you know we're, we're having to cut things and the economy is terrible, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Let's get the heck out of these things. So um, the problem, and here's the hook, the hook, cancellation fees. You can't just get out of this. You're dealing with the mafia. You can't, get, you can't just walk away from this. So um, I'm going to write down the numbers. And I want to clarify a few points on this. So according to this study, uh, total from the school district, just the school district of Philadelphia, by the way, uh, two banks through, through swaps, their payout was $157,965,000. Better fire the teachers. This is just the this is a pain, it's a total amount of pain, it's the best it, 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 gets, it gets worse. The, net, the total that the banks pay to them is $86 million. Now, I, I want to clarify one thing. We don't know that the bank was the principal party on the other side. Oh my God. We don't know that. It could have been anybody else, because maybe sometimes they took a principal position on the other side. 
and, or other times they may have just been acting as an agent, which in case they're just clipping a little bit off the interest rates as their fee. <coughs> that's disclosed. Well, I don't know whether that's disclosed. Um, so their net cost, their net cost, uh, when you subtract these two numbers, comes to about $72 million. This is what it costs them. Without the cancellation fee. When you go into the news and, and so you that's listen. that's on top of what they borrowed initially. I mean, well, this is, this is their net, their net interest payment. Right. Their net interest payment. And it's not the principal. No, no, it's not the right. principal. Right. Um, it's just the interest. Now, if you add on their cancellation fees, plus cancellation fees, this number jumps up to 161 million. And then they raised property taxes. <laughs> wait, wait a minute, they borrowed 10 million? No, no, that was, that was just a, a for, they, they, they borrowed much more than that. I, that was just a number I used to do the calculation for simplicity. Forget about, I mean, the 10 million was just used for illustration. Just, for illustration. Oh, okay. just as an example. So, so what the point, the, the main number from? here is when you add on their cancellation fees on top of their net cost, and net cost, in other words, their opportunity loss. In other words, this is money that if they had stayed in a floating or if they had been able to get out without cancellation fees, you know, what do you normally do? You have a mortgage, you put, you're borrowing money at 10%, interest rates go to 2%, you're not going to continue to pay 10%, yeah. you're going to refinance. And it's not all that big a deal. How much, you, know, you go to a bank, if your credit quality is still good, you can, you can refinance, you can pay off your original loan, and now you're paying a much lower rate. That's typically what happens, right? Mm -hmm. That's prepayment. You can do that. Anybody can do that with any mortgage, but not with a swap. A swap is not a mortgage. It's a derivative. So you've got, can, with your cancellation fees, you've got the opportunity cost of 72 million that could have been used to pay, pay salaries, uh, you, know, you know, whatever, whatever you name it. And then you have the actual loss, which are the, and, you know, the difference between the 71 and 160 is about 90 million in cancellation fees. Now here's, here's a really huge number. She, the, the, the author of this goes through and uh, calculates the estimated cost to Philadelphia from various swap agreements. The total cost, I'll put it up here. The total cost to Philadelphia is three hundred thirty one million from cancellation fees. Apparently they canceled all their interest rate swaps. Because like, there's no way they can justify it. being locked in at four percent with interest rates of 0.25. So um, they, they go further to point out that uh, the Philadelphia School District had a $629 million shortfall to cover. So they went and laid off teachers, they did whatever they did, you know, cut programs. And in the meantime, carrot parties are very happy because they've made a killing. So, okay, let me make a couple of comments on, on this. Um, you have to ask, what, what are some of the questions you have to ask? You have to ask, if this happened in Philadelphia, what the heck is going on in the rest of the country? How widespread is this stuff? What really is going on? I don't know of a source that actually describes it. I have, you, you have estimates. Uh, Borofsky stated something like, a, a, a low, a low number, I don't know, not number of, somebody else, there was an article in Fortune magazine that said that if the LIBOR was manipulated by, by a third of a percentage point, <coughs> 30 basis points, the total loss in this municipalities from the manipulation would be something like 300 million. That is not accurate because that doesn't count the cancellation fees. You can see the cancellation fees are huge. So, um, it's important to know what what's going on here. Um, how did how did Barclays actually manipulate the LIBOR? There's a lot of details we don't have. Who were they in collusion with? So uh, this change in the value 
value of the swap interest rate is directly tied to live work. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, that's the point. That's the point. You can't believe, don't believe the line that the counterparties didn't know the interest rates were going to go down. And it's, this is like, this is like, I don't know, you can, you can make up your own analogy of what this is like. The municipalities and the people who are running the budgets in the municipalities do not stand a snowball's chance in hell of going up against these bankers. Okay? Because they're sources of information, they're sources of intelligence. They, they, they got, they're connected all over the place. Good. And they're not going to enter into something unless they know they're going to make money off it. Something like this. Now, the other thing is, they were continuing to make money. And, you, know, you know, you get into this question of, oh, the TARP program, well, it wasn't so bad because they actually paid it all back. But paid it back out. Paid it back with stuff like this. Yeah. Paid it back with... Um, by getting uh, you know you know zero interest money from the government and lending it back to them at three percent, that's that's how they got the money to pay pay you know so you have you can't be don't be uh, swayed by what is in the media and the kinds kinds of arguments they're giving because they're not really you have to look at all sides of these things. The government is is a co-conspirator with the banks in allowing this to happen because. Commodity, Commodities Futures Modernization Act of 2000, yeah. and as she mentioned, uh, that made it illegal for the states to make gambling illegal. The states could not, you know, normally the states can step in and, and say to the districts, you can't do this. It's illegal because it's gambling. It's a form of gambling. Yeah. yeah. Part of this is the deregulation that occurred under the Reagan administration when they. Uh, they took out the, the uh, rigs that the, the Treasury Department had had something that they were able to monitor municipalities with. I'm not sure exactly what it was, but they took that out. And then later on, in 2000, they took out even more of it. Well, I would say in this case, uh, it should never have been the case that municipalities could enter into such a thing. And municipalities have no business engaging in, in derivatives. There's one other shocking fact here that I want to. Uh, can somebody give me an estimate? I just want to go around, you know, just throw out some numbers on what, what is the size of the um, interest rate swaps market? But by size, I mean, um, Notional amounts, you know, I, I use the, 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 uh, the number of 10 million. That's a notional amount. In other words, you hear the payments to what your assumed underlying amount is that you're, you know, you're taking 4% of what? Or you're taking 7% of what? That's the notional amount. The notional amount for, to get, enter into an interest rate swap, you don't even have to put up any money. There's no collateral involved. So, who, does anybody have an idea, roughly, what the size of the interest rate swaps market is? I'm just taking a full part guess. Uh, maybe 25 trillion. So. What did you say? It's, I, I, I thought it was well over 500 trillion. 900 trillion. 800. Well, that's closer. Uh, just for the swaps, I'm not talking about all derivatives. I'm just talking about interest rate swaps. As of 2009, 427 trillion. <laughs> the underlying notional amounts of interest rate swaps that are out there, and this is according to, I'm not making this number up, this is according to the uh, International Swaps and Derivatives Association. Mm. <laughs> oh, God. Are there so-called investors who are invested on this bank side of it? Like one argument you get against glass legal is that we shouldn't separate the banks and we can't write this off because there are people who invested, who should be paid this money that was gotten through theft. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that, that brings me to the next phase of, of what you know, I think is, you know, how is Glass-Steagall going to correct this? You, can you cancel these, these obligations? I mean, these, these are contracts. Well, if you try to cancel it, you, you know all the banks are going to hit you with lawsuits before, you know, within two hours. 
Mm -hmm. try, it, you, can't, you can't just cancel. How, much, how many trillions did you say the interrate swap financial is? That's uh, 427. 427 yeah. trillion. Oh, okay. Besides, so the two. The All right, the way I see it, correct me if I'm wrong, because I could be. Um, this is a problem that only the federal government can, can solve. And it means that the federal government has to step up and inter intervene and say, you know, we have to protect the municipalities. We have to stop this. We're going to settle it. You know, Glass-Steagall will we'll put them into bankruptcy and maybe becomes part of the bankruptcy proceedings. Everything is frozen, maybe. I don't know. I don't know the answer. But, but you know, going beyond that, if the municipalities now have these huge glaring holes, what well, happens that you, after I, these interest rate swaps? Well, the said is that we should bail out the municipalities instead of the banks. Well, yeah, of course. So what we yeah. do is redirect. Just let it all go, and we redirect the credit towards the municipalities. Well, I don't know how you can let it go. Let, let, well, you, can, you, can, you can say we're no longer going to bail out your right. debt. That's fine. So if, if the counterparties you know, go under, that's fine. There's no longer any obligation. You segregate it, but in addition to the segregation, you need you need tons of regulation. You need a lot of regulation, and you need like as I see it, you, you need a change in ethic, a change in morality, what the role of government oh. is. Oh. <laughs> and, you know, the government is not supposed to play the role of a predator. It's not supposed <laughs> to play the role of joining the predators to prey on the municipalities, which is exactly what happened in this. Well, what happens if they were brought up? Banks, uh, that if you look like a record, okay. he's going to make his closing remarks, and then I should give this important discussion. That was it. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <All> right. <laughs>